I'm threshing wheat and this last couple weeks I've been harvesting and threshing wheat grinding it into flour and uh, I've finally gotten a system that I think is working pretty efficiently so I'll share that with you later in the video but this whole episode is going to be devoted to the wheat harvest which uh, takes up a significant amount of time but it also nets us a large amount of calories and this wheat would have been planted last fall when fossil fuels were widely available and then as fossil fuels crashed through the spring the wheat grew up and just sat there and was not able to be harvested so I had to come and harvest it by hand uh, using using uh, very minimal fossil fuels. I did use my truck to move all of the, the stuff back to my house but it was only a mile so you know we used a minimal amount of gas uh, really to get this job done and now I am in the process of threshing this is about half of what uh, I harvested so I'm about halfway through the threshing um, I'll take you through it as I go but uh, welcome to this week in uh, Food Mageddon where we're harvesting wheat usually don't see me here until the end of the video, but I thought I'd jump on just in case there's some new viewers to the Food Foodmageddon uh, series because of this wheat video. And I just want to let you know what we're doing. Basically, um, we are simulating the collapse of fossil fuels in uh, today's food system. So back in January, we started weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels as if there was some sort of fossil fuel crisis. Uh, luckily, this worked out really well because we were really prepared for uh, COVID hitting. And uh, essentially, uh, by September, we will be completely cut off from the outside world, and the only food that we can add uh, to our pantry will be from what we are able to get ourselves with human power around our house. So part of that process is harvesting uh, the wheat from a nearby uh, farm. And you may uh, see me talk about how if fossil fuels disappeared, um, this is what we would have to do in actual terms as if it was actually happening. Because what this series is meant to be is a window into an alternative reality where fossil fuels have collapsed. So uh, I'll make some links here. Uh, you can go back to the beginning and start watching uh, from the beginning if you're interested. We have, week, uh, we have episodes almost every week um, telling about how we prepared, what we're doing, and how we're coping uh, with the loss of fossil fuels uh, in our food system. I which I think is a really important thing to consider, um, especially with the disruptions in the food system we've seen since the coronavirus has been has been happening. So uh, yeah, have a look back and I hope you'll subscribe and uh, share this with some friends. So thanks for watching. It's time to harvest wheat. This was planted last fall on my neighbor's property, but now uh, if you didn't have fossil fuels, how would you harvest it? Uh, and luckily I happen to have the tools to do it. So we're going to be harvesting about a tenth of an acre and I'm going to be letting you know exactly how much work it is to harvest a tenth of an acre. A tenth of an acre is about 4,350 square feet and it should have enough, uh, should have about eight bushels uh, worth of wheat, which will be 450 pounds of grain. We'll see how it goes. Well, I've done half a row out of six and I already have a big appreciation for uh, not only the people that could do this well, hundreds of years ago, but also the modern machines that, you know, could do this with fossil fuels, because uh, it's a lot of work and also a lot of skill. So uh, don't take this as a good instruction. This is just me practicing and learning how to do it. Maybe by the, by the end of this week, I'll have a good, good rhythm and pattern down. But my goal basically is to use this scythe to cut and cradle as much wheat as I can and drop it neatly into a pile with all the heads on one side and all the stubby tails on the other. Doesn't always work out. Thank you. 
it's quicker, I'm finding, if I make a foul, a foul throw to just come and fix it. And I'm getting a lot of shatter, which means a lot of grain is falling out on the ground because the heads are shaking and it's knocking the grain loose. Problem is, this grain's too dry. I should have harvested this a week ago. I don't have that background knowledge that someone a hundred years ago would have had to know that I should have done it earlier. this maybe five minutes with the side that's the easy part now I have to bundle them into sheaths and this is dwarf wheat you can see how short it is thanks to Norman Borlaug in the 1960s who developed this dwarf wheat we can grow a lot more wheat on the head of each um, stalk than we used to be able to uh, if this wheat were as tall as old wheat was then it would lodge the head would be too heavy for the strand and it would knock all it would lodge in the ground and become useless. So they shortened the wheat. It was a Japanese dwarf variety. They crossbred it, shortened the wheat, and now you can grow tons of wheat on each stalk. However, I can't do what I used to do, which was use the stalk itself as a binder for a sheaf of wheat or a, a clump, a, a group of wheat that you bind together. You just use the, the wheat itself to do it. This is too short, so I have to use twine, which is kind of annoying. Um, but now I have to bind all this together. Now in days long ago when people actually mowed their own wheat like this, this would be the job of two binders for every one mower because you can mow twice as fast as you can bind. So usually it would be the husband generally doing the scything. The more evenly you mow this, the easier it is for the binders. So you had to be as skillful as possible not to upset <laughs> the people that had to come after you and, and clean it all up. And then the wife, and older, uh, older kids helping with the binding, and the younger kids, they'd be picking up off the ground these loose heads and stuffing them in a sack. These are gleanings. You may have heard in the Bible, or maybe uh, old accounts of agriculture, gleanings in fields. This is what you pick up off the ground that's not attached to the stock anymore. And biblically, you're supposed to leave it for poor people and the birds. Um, I may or may not do that. Uh, I may just pick it up myself, uh, so we'll see. We'll maybe get some kids out here uh, soon to help me help me with this. So after about eight hours of harvesting total, I have all of these sheaves of wheat, which are bundles of wheat, piled in my garage. Um, and I have to process them into grain as quickly, or process them to get the grain out as quickly as possible. Each one of these heads has grains and chaff in them. And so I have to essentially do that to all, every single head to get the grain out. And the process to get that grain out is called threshing. And there's many different ways to do it. The traditional way would be to put this all on, a, on the ground and beat it with flails. Um, or have oxen trod over them until they knock all the heads loose, or have kids jump on it, or beat it with sticks. There's all kinds of different ways to do it depending on where you are in the world. 
another kind of low budget way to do it if you have a small plot of, of wheat that you want to work um, is to use just a clean tub. So this is a clean garbage bin. I have never used it for garbage. It's only for food and food related processing. Uh, so if I take this sheaf, open it up, and this is why it's important to get all the heads on one side of the sheaf and all the, the straw on the other side so that you don't have to go through later and pick through and make sure that it's aligned. See here, I have to turn, grab all these heads and turn them around. So that they're all aligned to one end. And this increase, this is what really increases the time to process. So it really behooves you to make sure you align all the grain really carefully in the field to save yourself time later. And then really I just take these heads of grain and beat them. Beat them on both sides and you can see the grain heads are still here but there's no grain left in them. All of the very dry seeds have dropped out. So now that's just straw. Straw straw is when it doesn't have any seeds in it. Hay is when it does. So now it's straw. This is hay and this is straw technically speaking. So we could do that a lot, but um, I've built a flailing, uh, a flailing machine, basically, that can be run by bicycle. I'm going to use a motor, uh, an electric motor, because it's just me. You need two people to operate it if you run it with a bicycle. Uh, but it's right behind me here, so let's have a look at that. So over here I have essentially what amounts to a large octagonal drum, and right now I have it set at this can close, but right now I have stops in here and I'll show you why later. So what you can do is put in your wheat here, close it, latch it, and then ride a bicycle and it turns a series of flails in inside and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, I have it set up right now with this opening so that I can let it run and I will stick the sheaves of wheat in as you'll see, but this is a little bit of a modification to run as a one person operation as opposed to a, a a two-person operation. You could run it as a batch, meaning you put it in, run it for a set amount of time, and then clean it out. I'm going to run it continuously and just keep putting heads in until it's full. Um, so what this is essentially is a central axle with these flails that uh, spin in kind of a worm pattern. So it pushes everything this way and then this, the seeds and chaff fall down uh, this this open slot in the in the on the side. So I add things over here, and it gets beaten as they move down. And then I have to clear out all the straw and the excess chaff. But most of the or almost all the seeds and some of the chaff falls down through this gap. And uh, you're not supposed to run it with it open, but we'll do it here just for fun, so you can see. Now this gets to be very dusty, so I'm going to wear a respirator and I'm going to tie my hair up with a bandana to keep the dust out of my hair. That, here comes the respirator, which makes it a little hard to talk, plus it'll be loud anyway. Um, but essentially what I'm going to do is take from my wheat over here, and then as this is spinning, put the heads of grain in, and those flails will knock the the wheat right off of it, then I can pull the straw out and put it in that uh, waiting wheelbarrow. So uh, here we go. Okay, so, oh, sorry, got my respirator off. Okay, so now that I've run it, 
in here we've got a lot of chopped straw. And the stuff on top I can just take out because all the grain is falling to the bottom. So I can pretty safely just grab this stuff and chuck it out. And what's left in here is just grain and chaff. And I'll just sweep all that grain down the little gap there. Take a straw out. There we go. Ready for the next batch. Underneath, then, is the bucket. Now this is full of chaff and seeds. So I'm gonna run it through a sorter and then we'll do some winnowing and we'll do some winnowing to get to the grain. And now we have the sorting machine which is a series of boxes basically with different sizes of screen in them from quarter inch to eighth inch to window screen below and each one is going to separate out different sizes of seeds or chaff and what I want is to save everything that comes out of this gap so at the bottom of this chute I have a bucket that will catch hopefully most of the grain that's going to come through so let's have a look to see here And now, I can use, on the side here I've got a handle, I can shake it, and I find it helps kind of really have my stuff in this but this will be a little bit of a gap. And now, so my angle isn't very steep, so I get a lot that gets stuck up here. And a lot of this is chaff, but we'll get rid of that on the next go through. All right. Now I have my bucket of mostly similar sized chaff and then underneath are a whole bunch of seeds that are kind of hard to see. Okay, and now I have a widowing tower. So essentially what this is, so a fan sucking in air, it blows it up this tower and then back out. So there's good wind coming out right here. Now what happens, is I pour the chaff and the wheat into this hopper and it has a little door that a choke door that I can adjust here so it'll just let out a trickle of the chaff and the wheat and the seeds will drop down in here and as they drop the wind will blow the chaff up and out and down here the heavier wheat seeds will fall and drop there's a screen here that catches them and then drops them into this bucket. This is a more, a fancier way to do it than you could. I could just sit with a bucket underneath the fan and then pour the other bucket, but that needs a lot more attention and time. This only should take one or two passes and the grain should be clean. At this point, it's pretty clean. Got some here. So I can just kind of I've finally gotten a system that I think is working pretty efficiently, so I'll share that with you. So the first step I take is I use my trusty uh, threshing tub here. And I grab a, a sheaf of wheat. And, uh, you know, I, I've done this different ways in um, other parts of the videos. You'll see where I can feed this directly into my thresher, but I'm finding this to be a more efficient use of my time. So what I do is I hold it over my bucket by straddling it, and then I just cut the heads off. Now, 
if this wheat has been bundled really nicely and all the heads are on one side, I can get by with just cutting the top half or so of the, the sheath into this bucket. But in many cases, I end up having to cut this wheat into quarters and just throw it all in because the heads get dispersed throughout the entire length of the sheath. In future years, um, I might uh, make more effort to make sure that everything is aligned in the field uh, because that would mean I have to thresh half the amount of wheat or half the amount of straw. So I still have a lot of heads in here. Sometimes if there's only a few, I'll pick them out. So now I take this bucket full of uh, cut up straw and drop it into my thresher. And I can do about half a sheaf at a time. Otherwise it gets overloaded and it won't thresh properly. There's not enough space in there. Close that up. Turn on two switches. I turn on the fan, which I'll show you in a minute. The fan blows the chaff away as it falls out from underneath, saving me the winnowing step that you've seen elsewhere in the video. And then I turn on the motor. And 30 seconds seems to be about plenty. Then I can check, look through and find some heads and just give them a feel. If I try three of them and they're all threshed, then I consider it to be done. Yep, all the heads are off. So now this just goes in my wheelbarrow. And the process continues. I'll add more to the threshing machine and start it back up. So what happens here is wheat and chaff fall out of this, this vent here in the bottom of the thresher. They hit uh, here and the chaff is blown away by this fan, uh, which I have on running on the highest speed. This is a uh, trash can lid. This is my food trash can that never actually uses, gets trash on it. It's just a big container of food safe plastic that I keep clean. Um, and this ends up obviating both the sorting that you saw as well as the winnowing for the most part. I'll have to winnow it a couple times, but I don't need to use my big winnowing tower. I have all this extra equipment that I don't actually need to use now. So that's fun. Uh, anyway, so here, let me uh, turn this on and we can see it in action. There's a little bit to toss out, but for the most part, this does a pretty good job with about 80 to 90 percent of the chaff I usually have to deal with. So, makes pretty clean and pretty quick work of the the rest of the winnowing process. I take the half winnowed bucket or lid and pour it into a bucket. And then later I'll winnow this for the remaining small amount of, of chaff that remains in here. Not fully clean, but pretty close. Just a couple of rounds of winnowing will get that ready to use. And now I'm in the garage, I'm building a uh, stand that's going to go behind my stationary bike to grind uh, wheat and other things into flour or other ground uh, seeds. Okay, now what I have is my finished 
stand with my grain mill mounted here and my wheel V-belt that turns down there. So what I need to do now is connect the belt. So this is a variable length belt because this is kind of a long connection. It's about seven feet of belt that I need. And most belts aren't seven feet long, plus I'd have to cut a hole in this to, make, to get it through. So this variable length belt just seemed to be like the best solution to all of my, all of life's problems. Ah. Other than the fact that they are kind of annoying to get set up, but once they're set up, they're great. They have less vibration, supposedly, than a regular belt. And again, this is not a how-to blog, so I'm not going to go through the exact way to deal with these belts because there are people with more expertise on them than me. <clears throat> uh, but suffice it to say, it's a whole bunch of links with a polymer, a polymer plasticine type thing, and they link together in a pretty clever way. Got two there links through it's got little notches and they're pretty cool uh, so look up a variable or a linked B V belt on YouTube and you can find all kinds of videos about how they work and what they're about um, I'll link to one here if I get around to it all right the nice thing is I can put it right through a hole without cutting a slot right because I have it in a in a closed hole in the wood. The fewer openings I have, the less place for flour and other bits to get everywhere because everything that gets covered in flour will attract rodents and then once you get rodents you get feces and urine and then it makes it unsterile and unfit to use. So I really do want to keep this stuff as cleanable as possible and having a more enclosed housing is one way to do that. Oof. There we go, let's see. Hey, it's turned the right way and everything. Oof. Now we have to limit this to 300 RPMs. So now I need to count how many RPMs this takes for every spin of this. Cool. It's only five. That's awesome. That means I can turn at a much more comfortable pace. Oh yeah. That's much better than using my arm. And now I take that cleaned grain that I just cleaned all these bits of, of wheat and I'm going to put them on top of this hopper and fit these stainless steel burrs on my mill. I've kind of jerry-rigged a, a little hopper with a spout here. It could be a little more permanent once I get it exactly how I want it but for now I'm going to do with, with this. And again, this can be run by a bicycle. And all winter I anticipate I will be running it with a bicycle so I can have some exercise when I'm stuck inside on the snowy, snowy days. But for today, I'm gonna run it on an electric motor powered by our solar panels and battery. So now I will uh, fill this hopper with about three quarts of grain. Now usually, I'm only gonna grind this right before I use it, so I'm about to use this flour. Um, otherwise, I just keep it in the berry form in these buckets in my basement. But since I'm gonna use this flour, I'm gonna grind it now.
Okay, now it's time to use the flour. And so this is um, some of the flour I ground. And this is not whole wheat flour, this is whole grain flour. And I'm finding that it is much more difficult to bake with than white flour that you buy at the grocery store. Um, the main reason is, um, when you're baking with white flour, and you knead it, right, we all, most of us know that uh, kneading it forms the gluten, which are chains. Kind of think of them as like elastic bands that form in the structure, and that's what gives it that, that uh, bready consistency that we like. The bran and the, the germ and the other things that are left in the flour act like little glass shards. So imagine you have a bowl full of rubber bands that you want to make the gluten, right? And then you throw a whole bunch of glass in there and then you knead it, it cuts all those bands to bits. And so you don't have that nice gluten structure that you generally would want. So I've had to adapt and I still don't have a good handle on baking with this yet, so I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, one tip that I did learn is that when you uh, mix it, instead of putting your water and your flour together and mixing right away, you wanna let it sit for about 10 minutes and that weakens and breaks up the bran and the other bits that would otherwise break the gluten down. It, it causes them to soften and breaks less of your gluten. So that's one tip I've learned um, from the internet, but I, or I still have a lot of adjustments to make in my usual bread making process. So I'm just gonna make a simple sourdough and here I have my sourdough starter that I mixed last night, it's active. So I'll take my mixing bowl, my scale, and now I'll add a pound and a half of the whole grain flour, and then I'm gonna add a half a pound of white flour, just to give me a little extra wiggle room. And then I'm gonna add four ounces of this starter into a well in the middle, and then a tablespoon of salt. And since this is a two pound loaf, I'm gonna do about 70% hydration, so I will add a pound of water, that's 50%, and then another five ounces of water, and then I'll mix that up real lightly, just so it's kind of mixed in, and then I'll let it sit for 10 minutes before kneading. All right, it's been 10 minutes. And instead of just letting this mixer run or kneading it com continuously, I'm just going to knead it for a minute and let it rest for a minute, knead it for a minute, let it rest for a minute. That in effect has the same effect as kneading it for 10 minutes. If I do that on, off, on, off for 10 minutes, it, it's gonna be the same effect. Now instead of using my usual kneading method, it's risen some, I'm going to just stretch and pull the dough, trying to build up the gluten and the structure. Um, if I knead it, I'm afraid I'm going to overwork the dough really easily just because of the, the different nature of this. So just draw and pull over. Let that do a little more rising now. And now I'm oiling up a pan. And I'm gonna drop the dough into it now that it's risen again. Never mind the noise of the fire truck being pushed around the floor over there. So the goal is to give this a little bit of a structure, so I'm using the pan. I haven't gotten to the point where I have enough control over this dough to make a freestanding loaf. But, hopefully, the pan will give this enough form that it will keep all of its nice bubbles inside. Let's see if I can shape this thing, it's pretty wet, and I don't want to overwork it, because we'll just tear all the gluten. Oh. 
That is one wet loaf. I guess I could challenge, reduce the challenge on myself by making a drier loaf, but. All right, let's get a flour covered tea towel over that to rise. They also say that it's possible to sieve out white flour from this and you lose about a third of the content. So I haven't tried this yeah. before, but let's see. Yeah. Yep, that would do it. So here's all that bran and germ and other things left over from the grinding process. So I can make bran muffins and other hearty things by adding that back in. And then here's the white flour. Oh yeah, definitely. So maybe I will try baking with the white flour someday. But for now, let's mix it all back in. Okay, it's as risen as it's gonna get. 425, and fingers crossed. Well, definitely not my greatest loaf of bread. Needs workshopping to work with this new flour. Is it getting better? Are you learning? You oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, it's just that. So used to cooking with baking with regular flour. I did I did try and sift some of it out some of it out, and I totally can do that. So I just did you have you tried doing the overnight? Yeah. With yeah. It? yeah. Same same thing. Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's all that sharp you know the the bran and the stuff and the gluten. You know what I should do is try and do just a, I'll sift an entire loaf and do just white bread from the stuff that I've harvested just to see how that goes. And then I'll have all that bran we can do things with, like, I don't know, bran muffins, which are yummy. Ugh, melted over the sides and now it's stuck in here. Ugh, finally. Yeah. This one took a beating, ugh. I mean the bread, and the, okay. the crumb itself looks fine, but the top. Well that was not my finest baking hour. I used to work in a bakery. I can actually bake bread. Um, and I have other videos that I'll link to here and here about making sourdough starter and also uh, baking, baking bread. So have a look at those for a little more successful. <coughs> yeah, a little more successful baking. Yeah. Well, that's all we have this week. Uh, thanks for joining us for this episode of Food Mageddon. I hope uh, you learned a little bit about what it takes to process wheat into flour and the amount of work uh, we take for granted when we buy a 10 pound bag of flour at the grocery store. Um, it, wheat's uh, been a, this has been a goal for me for, for years to do this. Um, so I've been really excited uh, and enjoying it for the most part. But I imagine that if I had to do this every year, uh, it would be it would become quite the chore um, anyway uh, thanks for watching again uh, don't forget to subscribe uh, share this with your friends uh, post us on uh, social media you can find us on social media we're at low tech institute on um, facebook instagram uh, on twitter we're low underscore techno uh, you can find our podcast the low tech podcast on uh, apple itunes google play stitcher and others uh, you can reach me, I'm Scott at lowtechinstitute.org, which is also our website, lowtechinstitute.org, where we have a blog, uh, we have all kinds of different projects going on, we're doing a beep reading project, we have uh, lots of other things right now. Um, I'm writing about COVID-19 in the long view of history on our blog. I've been doing an essay series where I'm adapting a book I wrote, uh, Why Did Ancient Civilizations Fail, to look at our current situation um, with the pandemic, to kind of put it in um, global, historic, and prehistoric perspective. So check that out at lowtechinstitute.org. Thanks again for watching. Uh, stay tuned for next week. We'll be back to our regular program where we're uh, working in the garden largely uh, harvesting uh, cucumbers and tomatoes, uh, I think, next week. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and uh, take care of yourselves.